Hey, this is David, pastor of Hamilton Life, and I want to thank you for taking a listen to our podcast. For more information on our church and how you can support the ministry, you can visit us online at hamiltonlifechurch.com. Thanks again for taking a listen, and we hope you enjoy the podcast today. Building up to this season of Christmas, building up to this season of friends and community and, and, and family, the past few weeks we have walked through the season of Advent here at Hamlin Life. We, we've learned about hope. We, we discovered there's peace. We, last week we, we realized that we can have joy. And as we come to the end of the Advent season here, today we're going to open our hearts and our minds to the idea of love. There, there's something somewhat magical about the Christmas season, is there not? There's, there's something that can warm even the coldest of hearts. Maybe we're not quite sure what it is, but during this time, we're more open to love. We're more susceptible to give. We have a greater desire of wanting peace, whether it be with family or friends or at your workplace. But have you noticed how quickly that leaves us after the new year? Maybe we're sick of Christmas music or tired of spending money, whatever it may be, but that magic seems to fade a little bit. And so this morning, we're going to be taking a closer look at love. We're going to be, being that is the season of giving, we're also going to seek and find out how this love is a gift, a gift that we cannot earn and we definitely do not deserve. This morning, we're going to be in the book of Luke chapter 2, and, and give you a little, set the scene a little bit. At this point, Mary and Joseph have made this long and treacherous j- trip to Bethlehem. Nine months pregnant. Could you imagine riding a donkey? <laughs> like any great distance at all? Nine months pregnant? So at this point in time, you know, they find themselves not only in Bethlehem, but in the back of a hotel, back of an inn. And not only are they at the back of an inn, they're where they keep the animals. So it probably didn't smell too great. It probably was dirty, uh, but Mary just wanted to give birth, right? And so this is where we find ourselves right now as we go to our reading in Luke chapter 2. And what we're going to do is read these scriptures together and pause just a few times along the way while we read the scripture to see what, what God can reveal to us, what we can pull from. And so we read in Luke chapter 2, verse 8. In the same region, that's the same region that Jesus is. Shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. First off, could you just imagine that? Imagine back in biblical times, they didn't have the light that we have or the noises and sounds that we have. And so you've got three shepherds in a field in the middle of the night, and then just boom, boom, you know, there's an angel. They had to be absolutely terrified, right? (laughs) That'd be like you or me going through the woods at night and seeing a UFO. You'd be paralyzed, right? And, and so it, it had to be startling. And then secondly from these scriptures, we notice that if the shepherds were not doing their jobs, they would have never had this opportunity. You'd be surprised what blessings can take place when we are faithful in our jobs. And lastly... The, these were lowly shepherds. It, it, the shepherd was sort of bottom of the barrel as far as biblical jobs go. But yet God chose these lowly shepherds to be the first to reveal his coming Messiah. And that's kind of a reoccurring thing in the Bible. The people that you least suspect, God uses for his glory. You know, maybe we don't feel like we have worth, or maybe we feel like we're nothing, we're nobody. And, but you're just the person God wants to use. That, that's just the person God wants to use so he can receive the glory. And so reading on now in verse 10, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. This is another kind of a reoccurrence in the Bible. And you'll see it as the Spirit reveals itself, as, as angels and heavenly hosts reveal themselves, as God reveals himself. He says, Do not fear, do, do not be afraid. See, God knows us. He, he understands us. He loves us. And he understands that encounters like this can be terrifying. And so he begins, but the angel here begins by saying, it's okay, it's okay. Do not fear. And reading on now in verse 11, Today a Savior, who is Messiah the Lord, was born for you in the city of David. Take notice it was born for you. 
This will be the sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in cloth and lying in a feeding trough. Suddenly, there was a multitude of heavenly hosts with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to people he favors. There's a few things to ponder here. First, the shepherds had to be scratching their heads just a little bit. These people have waited thousands of years for a coming Messiah. Prophecy after prophecy. So it had to be exciting that this Messiah is finally coming. But at the same time, they had to be saying, yeah, the Messiah is coming. He's being born. You know, feeding trough? Like, that doesn't make any sense to us. And God does work in mysterious ways, but see, this is Jesus' life of humility. His whole life, he was humble and full of humility. But he was also born into humility. What? How can you be born any lower than uh, in a room where they keep animals and, and in a pile of hay? It's humility. And then another thing we can take note of here is if here we see the heavenly host and the angels singing and praising God. If the angels sing and praise God, how much more should we? It's just something to think about. And then in verse 15, we read, When the angels had left and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what's happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a feeding trough. After seeing them, they reported the message that they were told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating upon them. I'll be honest, that last verse to me paused me, stopped me. I'm like, what, what could that mean? And here's what I believe. Mary was treasuring these things up in her heart and meditating upon them. A mother forgets nothing in respecting her children. You know everything that they do, that they suffer, everything that's said of them. And so Mary had to be processing the reality of this at this point in time. See, Mary's been through a lot. From the virgin birth to the prophecy of the trip to Bethlehem, nine months pregnant, and they get to Bethlehem, they have nowhere to go, knocking on door, knocking on door. And they, then finally the end says, yeah, you can go out back where we keep the animals. You know, and she, and she probably didn't care at that point. She just wanted the baby gone, right? Get out of me, right? And so it, it had to be miserable at the same time, but she's been through a lot. And then as she gave birth to Jesus, it all off. You have three shepherds coming, confirming everything that you've been told. So this had to be a lot of weight upon her. And so here we find her pausing, stopping and meditating on all of this. And finally, in verse 20, the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had seen and heard, just as they had been told. This section of scriptures not only describes the birth of Jesus, but it also reminds us why we celebrate Christ on this holiday. There's a few things that we can pull from this scripture, um, and the first one is being find love, find love. We the world searches for love. You search for love, whether it be finding a significant other or friends or family community to love you, or you search. For for love trying to fill a void that you may have within yourself. E even the most lost of people search for love. It's not just a biblical thing. It's human nature. But what happens is people find themselves looking for this love in all the wrong places. People find themselves joining different cults or religions. A, a, a lost and hopeless boy finds acceptance in joining a violent street gang. The music star or, or movie star tries to fill this void through fame and fortune. Or, or maybe you find yourself buying material item after material item trying to fill a void. But what they don't realize is they're trying to fill a void that they can never fill. And they sit and they wonder. They're not quite sure what it is, but they wonder why none of this brings them happiness. And they sit in emptiness. Have you ever felt emptiness? I have. It... You can have everything and be on top of the world and still be empty. You, you can be at the lowest of low and be full of emptiness. So they sit and they wonder why none of this brings them happiness. They search for love. And we can find love throughout the Bible as a general overall theme. That is the whole message of the gospel, is love. 
If you want to be Christ-like, love. If you want to know the character of God, love. From the creation of Adam and Eve, God's love for man. And then to just moving on, you've got the creation of the law and, and sacrifices. See, God basically saw that we kept killing each other. And so he put something in place to point us in the direction of righteousness. However, we later find we can't keep that righteousness. But then you look through multiple characters of the Bible. Um, King David has to be one of my favorite characters of the Bible. And he messed up over and over and over and over again. Yet God still loved him. The Bible even says King David was a man after God's own heart. God loved David. And, and God moving through the Bible more saw that, that we couldn't keep this righteousness. It wasn't possible. So in love, God sent his son to be that final sacrifice for our sins, to be mocked and ridiculed, spit on, beaten, and eventually murdered. Out of love. And, and, and nowadays, we can see love. We see love through grace. God understands that we are constantly failing, sinning human beings. So he extends to us grace mercy. God loved us enough to give us the ultimate Christmas gift. That's the gift of salvation. That is what the world truly searches for, yet sadly most people don't even recognize it. And what I love most about salvation is this. It, it's simple. It really is simple. Yet most people try to complicate it, do they not? And us human beings, if we're good at one thing, it's, we're good at complicating things. It is simple. Most people try to put weight upon it, conditions, you do this, do that, do that. No, it's simple. In Romans, we can read, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and he died on the cross for our sins and conquered death in the grave, you will be saved. Period. There's a period at the end of that sentence. It doesn't say you will be saved and you have to do this, 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 this. No, it's simple. The love of God is free. The love of God is a free gift. Think of a gift. If you have to do something to earn it or deserve it, it's not a gift, right? Because like I said in the beginning, we, we can't earn this. And we definitely don't deserve it. Now, we, we've looked at finding this love, fi finding love, and now we move into seeing love. Seeing love. The, the, the same way that Mary sat in a pile of hay looking at her newborn child, the, the same way that a mother sits and looks at her newborn child, God looks down upon you. He loves you unconditionally. God, being transparent with you, I, I often wonder why Jesus loves me. I, I do. I, I know all my faults. I know all my sins. I know all my failures. And yet he still loves me. Now, that's amazing to me. He knows all of your faults. If I deserve anything, if you deserve anything, if, if, if there's anything I deserve, it's death. That's what I deserve, death. But God loved us enough to send his son. He loved you enough to sacrifice his son so you can live. That's, what, that's what's amazing. See, for those of us who have received this gift, we, we recognize this. We we see this change within our lives in the things that we do and the things that others do. The, if you leave with anything today, leave, leave with this. This is the crux. The love of God is not being that perfect person. The love of God is not finding that perfect person. The love of God is seeing imperfect people. The love of God is not being perfect. It's not thinking someone else should be perfect. The love of God is seeing their imperfections. Perfect. Seeing love. And some of you are probably thinking, well, Ryan, you, you don't know the people I know. They are hard to love. I get it. I, I get it. I understand. Uh, there is such a thing as hard love. We may be scared we're going to get burned again or hurt again. 
whatever it may be, but love can be hard sometimes. It's human nature to love, and it's sinful nature to hate. It's natural. But only by accepting this gift can you ever have any power to suppress that natural desire to hate, but instead that love have dominion in your lives. See, most of us have suffered a broken heart. We have. If you've never suffered a broken heart, you've never loved. Because love and hurt go hand in hand. The only way to be hurt is to love someone. If I were to talk bad about your kids or your spouse, you'd be mad. You'd be hurt. Why? Because you love. Let us love others to where it hurts. Because love time, love, love is tough. But love never ends. Love ends in reconciliation. Love ends in justice and hope. In whatever situation you're going through, whatever difficult time you're having loving someone, or whatever it may be, if it doesn't end in hope at the end of that conversation, it's not love. And just always remember, you don't don't ever break someone's heart because they only have one, right? But if it hits the fan and you got to break something, break one of their bones. We have like 200 of those, right? <laughs> so the love of Christ is seeing love in the hard times, seeing love through the pain, seeing love through the trials and tribulations. Because it's so easy for us to see love when things are going good. It, it is. And we know everything good comes from God, but it's seeing love in those hard times. There's Maybe this will help you understand. When, when I was growing up, like most kids, I had two sets of grandparents. And each set of grandparents was on different financial positions, different financial seasons of life. And so at Christmas time, from one set of grandparents, we would get trampolines and bikes and gaming systems and uh, anti-skip CD players, right? If you've never had one of those, you've never heard. Um, and then from the other set of grandparents, we would get something like something that was on sale at the Dollar Tree, right? And now, as a kid, I, I honestly didn't notice it or take much care. I played with it. But now, as an adult, I can look back and see the love. And it's not from who you would expect, right? It was nothing for these set of grandparents to give us those lavish gifts. It didn't even hurt their pocketbook, to say the least. However, it was a struggle for this set of grandparents to give us those dollar treats. They spent money that they really didn't have to make us happy. And looking back now, those gifts to me were truly are truly more meaningful. See, there's love all around us, everywhere. But do you see it? Something that you may think is so small could mean the world to whoever's doing it for you. But maybe we ignore it. Maybe we don't see it. But it's all around us. Somebody loves you. Somebody is showing love to you. God is showing love to you. But do you see it? It's there. So we see love. We, we talked about finding love. And then we talked about seeing love. And here in the next minute or two, we're going to pass out communion elements for us. So when we do that, would when you get it, just hold on to it for a minute. We're going to uh, do that in a few minutes, but um, thank you, Johnny. If you, when you get it, just hold on to it. So we, we, we talked about finding love and seeing love, and then finally being, it is the season of Christmas, ho, ho, ho. we were going to talk about give love. See, God gave us love, so in turn, we should also give love. Giving love to those who are hard to love. Seeing what God sees in them. Because I promise you, it will all be worth it. But then again, you might say, Ryan, Ryan, listen, you don't understand. You don't know the people I know. They are so hard to love. They're as lost as a blind dog in a meat factory, and I can't I don't even want to talk to them. Listen, I, I get it. I understand. Everyone in here has someone that is hard to love. You see that phone call coming, and you're like, what's going on? We, 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 we 
don't want to talk to them at, at Christmas parties, we'll probably you avoid them in the room. Understand that it's okay to love from a distance, as long as we love. See, the, the, the natural side of us might want the opposite. Some of us may just want to cold walk that person, but by accepting this gift, we can allow love to reign dominion in our lives. Being in the church world, we, we heard the phrase spiritual maturity. Have you guys heard the phrase spiritual maturity before? <laughs> spiritual maturity seems to be defined in our culture nowadays by how much you know, how knowledgeable you are. Spiritual maturity seems to be defined by what theological seminary you went to, how much you know about God and Scripture and the church. And sadly, the people who claim to be the most spiritually mature are often usually the most judgmental, divisive, and self-righteous. See, Jesus had a different end in mind for spiritual maturity. Jesus defines spiritual maturity by not how much you know. Jesus defines spiritual maturity by how much you love. See, love has a speed. There's a speed to love. That speed is slow. It's slower than I am, it's slower than you are. Love does not hurry. Love pauses. Love lingers. Love offers full focus and gives way more than it takes. See, when I run, okay, that was bad enough, I'll just say run. When I hurry, I have a base love. And what happens is the ones I love the most ultimately end up paying the price for this. I've noticed, and maybe if you've noticed, that the, the art of conversation is kind of went downhill in the past few years. The quality conversation is not. And it's mostly because like we already know what's going on in our children's lives because we posted it, right? You know, I, I know your dog ate the Christmas. I know your wife back in the university at Target Park and whatnot. I know Hamlet in places in Nightmare because you posted it and used some explicit words. Listen, we know what's going on most of the time with each other before we even enter into that conversation. But see, love slows down the conversation. Love offers, love is engaging. It's asking a question after a question. Love is going Christmas is about love. 
It's about God's love for the world. It's about His gift to us. By receiving this gift, a gift that maybe you didn't even realize you needed, your whole life could be transformed. And by receiving this gift, can you ever find love? Can you ever see love? Can you ever give love? Feel love? This is your moment. If you've never it doesn't matter what your age is, what your track record has been. If Jesus doesn't care if you know a lot about scriptures or can even quote a Bible verse, it doesn't matter. Like I said before, it is simple. It is simple in the fact that if you never believe in Jesus, you will never see him. It's simple. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. Without the way, there's no going. You're going. Without the truth, there's no knowing. You're walking a blind walk. Without the life, there is no living. Just emptiness. God has given us an amazing gift, the gift of love, the gift of salvation. This season, may we recognize this love, may we see this love in others. As here in just a moment, as you take that communion out, and you place it in your mouth and do kind of crunches in your teeth a little bit. Think of love. Think of Christ's body being crushed for you. And as you drink that element, think of love. Think of the love of His blood innocently flowing out of His body. This is meeting here tomorrow, and you're welcome to come. I hope you invite as many people as you want. I hope there's not enough seats here. Uh, but we're meeting tomorrow at 4, and we're meeting in love. Love for this tribe, this community, love for our friends and family, the love of the magic on the kids' faces as they prepare to open the gifts of this world. But we're also meeting in love to show our thanks to God and all that he has loved. So the band's going to continue to play softly for just a moment. Slow down. Pause your life for just a moment. I know it's a busy bustle season. We've all got plans through the new year. I understand that. But for this minute, just slow down. Spend a moment alone in the privacy of your own seat with God. Reflecting on His love for you. Reflecting on your love for others. And when you're ready, at your own time, For more information on our church and how you can support the ministry, you can visit us online at HamiltonLifeChurch.com. Thanks again for taking a listen.